This podcast is brought to you by the Albany Public Library, Main Branch, and the generosity of listeners like you. What is a podcast? God, Daddy, these people talk as much as you do. Received cons on supervised learning. The full audio of this monologue has not been uploaded. To hear the rest of the monologue, please go to rezeeb.substack.com. Again, that's rezeeb.substack.com. Hey, everybody. Welcome to this episode of the Unsupervised Learning Podcast. And today I am going to be talking about the genetics and history of Madagascar. In case you don't know, Madagascar is an island off the southeast coast of Africa. It's about only 250 miles uh, from the coast of Mozambique. Um, it is on the so it is on the southwest edge of the Indian Ocean Basin. If you want to think about it another way, uh, Madagascar you probably know uh, because there are some. I think it's DreamWorks uh, films about Madagascar. I think it's like almost half a dozen now, and there's three television series. Uh, so I know about Madagascar because. Uh, my kids love the television series. I think it was on Netflix or Disney Plus or something. Um, and, you know, it, it has a, a lemur tribe and uh, also some other zoo animals. I'm not going to I'm not going to, like, repeat everything because I don't know all the details of what's going on in Madagascar. It's just funny and kids think it's hilarious. Uh, but I think one of the issues with Madagascar, and I point this in, in a couple of Substack pieces that I have out, uh, the first one is You Can't Make This Up, Madagascar, How the Planet Strangest Island Was Settled, uh, and The Unreal Voyages and Trials of Madagascar's Malagasy People Part 2. So um, if you are listening to this via my Substack, uh, you will have received emails about those pieces, so you should check them out. Um, and if you are subscribed on Spotify or you're watching this on YouTube, uh, you should check out uh, the Substack pieces at rezeeb.substack.com. Um, you know, you should um, just do the search bar of Madagascar if they're off the front page or something like that. But they shouldn't be yet. Uh, in any case, um, so I think Madagascar is really, really cool because the fauna is cool. And that's why you had these um, films that are made of Madagascar with Malagasy animals, Madagascan animals, right? Um, they're not Malagasy. Malagasy is ethnicity. In any case, uh, they're exotic. They're strange. But they're real. So you don't have to make up weird stuff. And, you know, the strangest ones are probably the lemurs. They look really strange to us. But lemurs are what are called prosimians. Uh, they're actually distantly related to other primates. And um, I think actually the prosimians are what is called a paraphyletic group, which means that there are some subsets of prosimians, I believe the targiers, uh, that are more closely related to monkeys and great apes. Uh, but, you know, as a stylized fact, you look at the phenotype, you look at the physical characteristics and prosimians, they look kind of different uh, than the monkeys and the great apes, um, you know, you know, our whole primate lineage. Uh, you know, the general stylized fact is, uh, oh, they're more primitive and all this stuff. Well, um, you know, like setting that aside, like these terms like primitive and derived are a little, a little outmoded, not necessarily informative. What happened, it seems, is that um, right before the age of the dinosaurs, probably... Um, a, a small group of, I think they're called adaptiforms. Um, they're a small group of primitive ancient primates. They're extinct. Uh, seem to have rafted over uh, to Madagascar. And this is when um, it was much closer and the currents were easier to get to from Africa. And so um, there were no other primates in Madagascar at the time. Uh, and so as monkeys uh, and, you know, actually apes, had a lot of the monkey-like niches before monkeys radiated in the old world. But setting aside from that, monkeys and apes, they dominate these frugivoric, uh, arboreal, you know, fruit-eater type ecological niches, right? Uh, on the African mainland, also in the New World. Well, in Madagascar, it's lemurs that don't do that, okay? And the thing with lemurs is they're really, really diverse. There's dozens and dozens of lemur types. And until recently, uh, there were actually giant lemurs uh, that were, you know, ground forms of lemurs and whatnot. And, you know, humans show up and, you know, it's fewer lemur species, right? But, you know, overall, it's it's not as exotic as Australia. Um, the, pros the prosimians are placental mammals. Uh, but there's a lot of Australia-like dynamics that are going on here. Obviously, bats, you know, and a few other, I think, maybe rodents or insectivores, 
uh, exist in um, in Madagascar, you know, but basically there's not that many mammals, right? So there was also an extinct form of hippopotamus, so probably uh, that was also a rafting or, you know, I mean, they're big animals, like maybe they can swim and survive somehow. Um, again, the hippos, they're gone because people show up. Probably the most famous animal, though, from Madagascar is not a mammal. Um, it's the elephant bird. Uh, elephant birds were these huge, huge flightless birds. They look like ostriches on steroids. They're, they're massive. Um, they stood 10 feet tall. They weighed 1,600 pounds. And uh, their eggs were also huge. They were 20 pounds. And the interesting thing about the eggs of um, elephant birds is it's quite clear that the ancestors of the Malagasy ate them. Uh, there's archaeological remains. It looks like people were eating, cooking eggs around fires. So I just call them prehistoric omelets, you know, so that the shells are about two millimeters thick. And I don't really know how this works, but apparently when Europeans showed up, Malagasy people were still using the shells, half shells as huge bowls. Um, so, I mean, could they have lasted that many centuries? I don't know. This seems implausible to me. But that's what I read. So the last evidence of the elephant birds is actually about 1250 AD. And we know that the Malagasy interacted with them. Uh, there's a word for like massive birds, and they call them the bird of the Ampatris. Ampatris is the southernmost region of Madagascar, probably where they were last surviving. Um, the last datable remains, and these sorts of things in archaeology are kind of a little squirrely, and so I'm going to be really careful and qualified when I say these sorts of things. But um, in general, the last datable remains are to 1250 AD, so you know, 750 years ago or so. Uh, several hundred years uh, before Europeans showed up. But um, French explorers claimed that there were sightings as late as the 1600s. I probably think that that's wrong. But um, usually what happens in archaeology and paleontology is the earliest and the last dated remains, uh, unless you ma somehow figure out a way to get a massive sample size, are usually underestimates or, um, of of the length, length of period, right? Um, so in general, uh, it's uh, actually... Um, they probably lasted, you know, some, some, some populations probably lasted, uh, um, greater than, uh, uh, 1250 AD, right? Uh, maybe not as late, um, maybe not as late as, uh, um, 12, as, uh, 1600s, but, you know, lasted a while. Um, so the elephant birds are pretty well known, um, in historically, uh, they're, they're pretty well known. Uh, in they're, they're, they're the basis for what's called the rock, um, who are these like flying eagles that could carry elephants and just weird stuff like that. They show up in the uh, stories of Sinbad the sail Sailor, um, and um, they show up, uh, uh, you know, in records of uh, Marcus, Marco Polo, uh, who lived uh, during the, um, what is it? Yeah, Marco Polo was like in the 12th, mid 12th, uh, no, second half of the 1200s, I believe, right? Um, and and so they were still around or memories of them were around during that period. They're associated with Madagascar. Now, obviously, these giant flightless birds are not or flightless birds are not the rock because they can't fly around. So what probably happened is you have the elephant birds. They're huge. They got huge eggs. And then you have these um, these, uh, these tropical eagles, uh, like crowned eagles, which no longer exist anymore. Uh, again, probably the habitat was destroyed by humans. And these massive eagles um, were also African crowned eagle. Um, they were native to the island, so probably people mushed them together, right? So Madagascar is known for all of these exotic animals, but um, the animals disappeared, right? And so um, why did animals disappear? Well, I mean, usually it's humans, and it does look like about 1,000 years ago, uh, around 1,000 AD, uh, starting maybe actually 900 AD, this massive, massive uh, exploitation um, of of Madagascar by humans. So habitat disappears. A lot of the animals probably just get hunted, uh, to be honest. But um, in general, uh, I think habitat de destruction is probably underestimated, if I had to bet, you know. Um, you know, these animals, they need, uh, uh, they need things to, um, you know, live off of. But, but um, I, I do want to say uh, one obscure fact, or not, maybe not obscure, um, is that... Uh, Lemurs are still scared of, um, you know, arboreal, like they're, they're scared of, of, fly, of things that are flying at them. Okay. They look around, they're still looking for things above them, but there's no African crowned eagles left. So what this is saying though, is they were well adapted 
um, they had to deal with African crowned eagles coming at them because they obviously ate them. So I'm imagining that ancient people like some mariner might have seen an African crowned eagle carrying a lemur away and might have thought it was like a, a person, like maybe a child, maybe an adult. I don't know. It depends on on how the perspective work. Right. So let's get to people because like, uh, I am not a wildlife biologist. Uh, I love animals. Um, that's how I got into biology. But you know, I do more of this human stuff, this human genetic stuff. OK, so um, let, let's talk about what's going on here. Uh, it is 750 miles, uh, 750 miles, or no, 250 miles from Africa. Um, it's about 5,000 miles uh, from Indonesia, okay? Um, so here's uh, a fun fact, though. Um, I don't know if it's fun. It's weird. Um, the Malagasy language is an Austronesian language, okay? Um, it is not a Bantu language. It is not an African language. It is an Austronesian language. Other Austronesian languages, Tagalog, the language of the Philippines, uh, languages in Polynesia, Austronesian language, like Rapa Nui in Easter Island, uh, off the coast of South America, Austronesian language. Obviously, Bahasa, um, Indonesian, which is kind of based on Malay, I believe. Malay is Austronesian, Javanese is Austronesian, Sudanese is Austronesian, and on, and so on, right? Um, in Vietnam, there's one Austronesian language, the Cham language, and they're actually descended from some Malay-like people that migrated 2,000 years ago from Malaysia, right? Um, so the Austronesians expanded out of Taiwan or the northern Philippines, it looks like, let's say 4,000 years ago. There's still some debates about how indigenous they are to Southeast Asia, but it looks right now that they expanded about starting about 4,000 years ago. Uh, you had the Lapita culture, um, these po proto-Polynesians that made it to Papua, I think, by 1,000 B.C., and, you know, they got to Hawaii, what is it, like um, like 1000 AD or something like that, maybe a little later, New Zealand, a little after 1000 AD, maybe 1200, 1300, and Rapa Nui, Easter Island at the same time, right? So it's like massive, massive expansions over thousands and thousands of years. But they also did go the other direction. Um, so there's, there's a fair amount of circumstantial evidence uh, that, um, you know, I, there are some... There are some animals and uh, agricultural products and loan words in East African languages. They look like they're Austronesian, right? And um, so they were they were present in the Indian Ocean. They did go further than Aceh, which is like as far west as the languages, uh, aside from Malagasy, are spoken. So the northern tip of Indonesia. But the language of the Malagasy is not just any Austronesian language. It's actually um, it's an East Barito language, which is named after the East Barito River. It's in south central Borneo. And there's a bunch of other languages there called East Barito River uh, languages. They're spoken by a people called the Dayak. So Borneo has a bunch of indigenous people, and indigenous just means oh they're pagan and they were oppressed by outsiders, I guess, because you know Malays are indigenous too, but they don't call them indigenous. But um, uh, the ba the the Dayak are one, the Iban are another. Um, I think Henry Golding, the actor, his mother is an is an Iban in Crazy Rich Asians. Um, so they're just they're a local Austronesian people. Um, one. One of the ways that they're different than, say, the Javanese or the Malays uh, or the Thai is that they had very little Indian influence culturally. So they never went through a Buddhist or um, Hindu period. And mostly they're not Muslim today. Uh, mostly they've converted to Christianity, but a lot of them retain their tribal religion, their ancestral religion, uh, Austronesian ancestor worship. And, um, yeah, they're not integrated into the bigger kind of like civilizational alliances that you see in Southeast Asia, right? Uh, so they're not part of some Muslim maritime configuration. They're not part of like mainland Buddhist civilization and or any of these things. They're not part of like the Catholic Filipino orbit, Filip you know, uh, in the Philippines. Uh, they're their own indigenous people with their animistic tribal religions. And until the, you know, probably early 20th century, they were headhunters, right? So these are these are like really intense people that live in an earlier mode of production, but they're right across the water from Java. So if you look at the map, they're not that far away. So they, they've been in and out of um, interaction with uh, these massive kind of like, you know, international polities that have connections to India and China and mainland Southeast Asia. But they didn't become part of them. Um, they didn't allow it to change their culture. And I think this is illustrating a little bit pre-modern societies. They're not totalitarian. Um, you have all these small groups that can persist and survive uh, and maintain their independence uh, and their differences uh, without changing. And then the empire falls and the people are still there. So, you know, it, it, this also is true in the Roman Empire. There are a lot of languages that were never written down. Uh, we only know that, that they existed because Latin 
uh, travelers mentioned them offhand in some diary or some letter. And so we know that there are people in you know some area of Asia Minor that spoke a totally different language than anything that's around there today. Um, Albanian uh, is an Illyrian language probably, and there's not that much evidence of Albanian from Roman written records. Most of the interior Balkans was Latin speaking officially. The South was obviously Greek. Uh, there was maybe a little less, a little like relic Thracian in the Eastern part, but, um, you know, Albanian shows up, I think in the middle ages, um, in some Christian monasteries, uh, there's some evidence of Albanian related languages in the Sinai, uh, just with some monks. And so this is, this is what happening in Indonesia. There's all these tribal groups, these indigenous groups that never participated in these Hindu Buddhist civilizations. And then later the Islamic sultanates, uh, they were just kind of there and they interacted with them but they never integrated with them the ancestors of the malagasy were one of these people right so we know that they speak uh, an east burrito language they actually speak a language very close to the manyan language it's a very specific language in a small area uh right interior of the southern coast of borneo so we know who their ancestors are culturally right um and you know this is just like figured out by linguistics or linguists um uh, decades ago. So the weird thing here to point out is uh, they're not one of the great empires. Uh, they're not one of the great polities. They're not Javanese. They're not Achanese. Uh, they're not Malays. Uh, these are people who are known in the historical records as having gone places. Okay. So the Javanese had fleets that went on to the Indian Ocean and northward. Uh, you know, uh, I think Majapahit, uh, the medieval Hindu empire uh, in Java was basically the precursor of Indonesia. So its um, its vessels uh, went from east to west all the way across modern Indonesia. That's like three or 4,000 miles. Uh, so it was a big empire, you know. Uh, but they didn't assimilate everyone. They didn't, they didn't last long enough to change the languages and whatnot. Um, but uh, we know that there were people. We know that, for example, Srivijaya, which is a proto-Malay empire, basically, uh, that's spanned the Straits of Malacca, was Buddhist, uh, they got into military conflict with the Southern Indian Empire called the Kola Empire, uh, or Shola. I don't, I don't want to say the like Coca-Cola, right? Uh, but, you know, they, they sent fleets across at each other across the Bay of Bengal. Uh, so there's some international stuff happening, and this isn't the only time this happened, by the way. Um, the Ottomans actually sent an expeditionary force to uh, northern, Indian, northern Sumatra once to aid an ally I think against the Portuguese. Um, this was like the 1500s, right? So the Indian Ocean's been interacting, and it's just this huge network of trade for thousands of years. And what they do is they utilize the monsoons. And the monsoons go one direction one part of the year and the other direction the other part of the year. And so you just follow them. And so you can do your trading and then leave and then come back just by the winds. And uh, there are Greek um, log books that go back more than 2,000 years that show that you know traders from the Red Sea ports of the... First, the Ptolemies and later the Romans uh, went all the way to India. They went down the coast of Africa. They went between Africa and India. So this was this western part of the Indian Ocean was all mapped out. We don't know as much of what was going on in the eastern part, but it's quite clear from trade goods that show up in China that it kept continuing. Um, when the Portuguese arrived, I have read, uh, into Indonesia uh, in the 1500s, they discovered a colony of Italians. And they were the terminus of Italian merchants uh, that had a secret trade uh, route uh, across through the Indian Ocean into Europe. And then obviously dis disembarked in Italy and Venice or Genova. I don't know where. where. Um, but uh, it was secret. And, um, you know, the, the secret kept their profits up. Uh, the Portuguese destroyed the colony. Um, anyway, my only point is there's stuff we don't know. Um, and the Malagasy are part of stuff we don't know, uh, because if the Malagasy didn't exist, we wouldn't know that these Manyan speaking Dayaks, uh, literal headhunters, uh, that are doing Sachsenberg agriculture in the forest, uh, right now, or were until recently, um, also got on ships. And, um, I think the most plausible hypothesis is they got on these ships and they, um, uh, you know, these were ships probably run by, you know, Malays. Uh, trade vessels that went into Arabia, East Africa, especially before the rise of Islam. And what happened was, um, you know, they provided services, uh, probably like indentured servants, these sorts of things. They were not the captains. They were not calling the shots, but they provided labor. And there's some legends about some of the ancestors of Malagasy being slaves and Javanese uh, fleets. Maybe that's, that's what's part of it. But um, um, whatever happened... Um, you know, they got to Madagascar, okay? 
And we know that they got to Madagascar because the language is clear, right? Um, and there's aspects of their culture uh, that it tell us like who they were and when they left. So there are Sanskrit loan words in Malagasy. Not too much, but some. Uh, that tells you that it has to be probably after 0 AD or 1 AD uh, because there's a massive wave of Indian migration around that time that transformed the maritime regions of uh, Southeast Asia as well as the mainland region. So, you know, 5 to 15% Indian ancestry across much of Southeast Asia. That's pretty old, actually. It's recently discovered. David Reich's labs pioneered it, but it's been obvious in the genetic data for a long time. Um, the, uh, the Dayak and the Iban, these interior Borneo people, they don't have any of that. So they're kind of a way to look at pristine Austronesians. And, you know, the Malagasy don't show very much evidence of that at all. They have like 1% maybe Indian ancestry, but that could be later merchants, and I'll get into that. Okay, so but they have Sanskrit, so that means that they were on the edge of these new empires, new polities, and Sanskrit spread into Tagalog. It spread into you know Philippine languages, so it, it's just part of the culture that was spreading at the time. But um, Malagasy doesn't have a huge, huge um, overlay of Indian words that became very prominent in certain types of Southeast Asian languages closer to 1000 AD. So probably it's considerably earlier than 1000 AD, but probably after 1 AD. Right. These proto Malagasy, whoever they are. So that's one thing. Another thing is um, their religion, the native religion of Madagascar, which is still around the Malagasy religion, even though most Malagasy are nominally Christian with a small minority that are Muslim, uh, is based on ancestor worship um, and like certain types of taboos uh, and whatnot. Basically, it's an it, it looks like an Austronesian religion before higher religions. Right. So, as I said, the Dayaks were pretty much pagan they were animists until relatively recently and their ancestors the malagasy ancestors were that as well uh they weren't any of the you know brand name religions so to speak uh that some people were already practicing in the indian ocean routes that early they were not christian probably before islam but they were not hindu they were not buddhist you know um so it tells you that they're on the margins they're marginal people as we would say in modern day discourse lingo they're outliers um and um in any case, um, you know, they're, they're not bearers of high culture. So Madagascar did not have, Malagasy did not have a written language until the 1500s. It was a modified form of Arabic, right? Um, so writing shows up, inscriptions show up in Indonesia, in Java, like first, second century. They're usually based on South Indian um, types of, I think, syllabary. Um, but whoever the ancestors of Malagasy were, they, did, they didn't have it. So they were Dayaks, right? They were illiterate, um, animists. And somehow they were part of the Indian Ocean Trading Network. Now, there's a hypothesis that you could do a straight shot to Madagascar, and you can um, with pre-modern sailing. And it's true, but um, it seems a little crazy. So I think it's more plausible that they were part of the trading networks and a small number of them uh, got to Madagascar. And I'm going to talk about the small number because we have some genetics that actually shed light on that. Um, and I will get to that. But first, like, let's let's talk about the dating a little bit more. Um, you know, I'm not an expert on Malagasy, Madagascar, Madagascan archaeology, but it looks like at about 500 AD, uh, there's clear, clear evidence that you cannot deny of human occupation on the island. So that actually aligns well with everything that I've said about linguistics and culture uh, of like who these people could be. Now, there are ev there is evidence of butchery of the hippopotamus and other things. Uh, way, way earlier, as early as maybe 8,000 BC or something like that. Or If those people existed um, from the genetic data that we have right now, it doesn't look like they left any evidence, any remnants. And second, there were no megafaunal expansions. So maybe there were uh, colonies of castaways that eventually went extinct. I don't know what the deal is, but um, all of the extinctions that we're talking about really seem to have kicked off uh, from the people that show up around 500 AD. Thank you for listening. To hear the rest of the monologue, please go to rezeeb.substack.com and subscribe. This podcast for kids. This is my favorite podcast.